Hey, what's up guys, this is Matt with The Movement System. Chances are, if you're a coach, a trainer, a physical therapist, or even an athlete, you've probably learned a lot about muscles. Whether it's from a textbook, or just experience in the gym, you've picked up on which muscles are involved in each exercise. But, what you might not know as much about is biomechanics. Biomechanics is the science of how forces interact with the body, both internally and externally. Biomechanics can help us understand pain, like why someone's lower back gets tight from certain positions like overhead press, but it's also important for performance, like why an athlete's 40 yard dash time drops by 0.2 seconds from moving the back foot back, shifting the shoulders forward, and using full shoulder extension on the first step. Understanding biomechanics completely changes how you coach and problem solve in the gym. So in this video, I'm gonna walk you through three biomechanics concepts that I think every coach should know, but most don't. And for each one, I'll show you real coaching solutions that you can use right away with your clients and athletes. Let's get into it. Okay, so let's start off with biomechanics concept number one, extend the runway. The basic principle here is simple. It's the difference between laying on a small patch of nails versus laying on a bed of nails. If you lay on a small patch of nails, that's a lot of focal pressure on one spot. That spot is probably going to hurt. But if you lay on a bed of nails, that spreads out the force. Now that's a static, simple example. Now let's extend this analogy to movement and enter into the realm of biomechanics. When you land from a jump, you absorb force. If you were to land really stiff, for example, on completely straight legs, you would end up with a lot of focal loading. Essentially, your runway for absorbing force would be really short. All the load would be taken up in one area. And on the extreme other end would be someone like a parkour athlete who lands into a roll. This spreads force out really far across multiple joints. Now, most athletic movements require a strategy somewhere in between. So to make this really tangible, let's take a look at a specific example of a basketball player that I'm working with. And these are the jumping mechanics of a college basketball player that I'm working with, and he does have knee pain. So let me walk you through my thought process. The runway is all of the joint movements and muscle actions that allow the athlete to both absorb force and create force. For jumping, the athlete is absorbing force through the ground contact phase and then creating force to jump up to a box or to dunk. Some of our strategies for absorbing force include first, knee flexion. We bend at the knees and we eccentrically activate our quads, for example. Similarly, we bend at the ankle and the hips and eccentrically load our calves and our glutes. And that all sort of happens in the sagittal plane. But we need to go one layer deeper than that to fully understand what's going on. Because force absorption doesn't just occur in the sagittal plane with big muscle groups. There's a lot of rotation through the lower leg during running and jumping. I call that rotation through the lower leg torsion, and it involves rotation at a few different joints. The force absorption phase of lower extremity torsion involves hip internal rotation, tibial internal rotation, and foot pronation. Hip internal rotation means that the femur is rotating inward to absorb force. The tibia also rotates inward to absorb force. And then lastly, the midfoot pronates or kind of flattens the arch to absorb force. Some athletes actually have a limitation in motions like hip internal rotation and struggle to absorb force. But I tested this athlete's hip internal rotation and he has plenty. He has everything that he needs to absorb force. But here's the thing, that's just half of the runway. The other half of the runway is all the motions that produce force. And that requires the femur to externally rotate, the tibia to externally rotate, and the midfoot to supinate. This spiral-like unwinding helps us to transfer that stored elastic energy from the force absorption phase into jumping power on the force creation phase. And this is where this athlete was actually having a deficit. He was essentially stuck in that force absorption phase. Here's why. It turns out that this athlete has a history of ankle sprains. Over time, his foot and ankle have stiffened up and don't allow the midfoot to open up or to supinate. And remember that supination is essential for going from force absorption to propulsion. We tested this with the table test, basically locking the forefoot down flat and seeing if the midfoot can rotate and open up and allow the knee to fall out to the side. Initially, this was very limited. So we worked on this drill to restore midfoot mobility. I gave him cues to put his weight in that front foot, to keep the base of the big toe on the ground, and then to rotate the knee out to the side to open up that midfoot. 
After two to three minutes of working this drill, we retested that midfoot motion and it improved significantly. This is a really big step in extending his runway. It helps him get out of being stuck in force absorption and go through the full process of absorbing force and creating force. Now it will take time, but this will help him spread out some of the focal loading that he's getting at his knee. So to circle all the way back to our initial analogy here, instead of a patch of nails under his knee, he'll be on a bed of nails spread out across multiple joints through his lower body. Now this is some really advanced biomechanics that took me years to learn from some of the best mentors all across the country. So give yourself some time to learn this. We actually teach this in more detail in our full continuing education course, Movement Assessment 101. It's a biomechanics based system that I put together with the best techniques from all of my different mentors to help you solve problems for your clients and athletes most effectively. It's actually the exact movement assessment that I go through with every client that I consult. It goes through an assessment like hip internal rotation, the table torsion test, ankle dorsiflexion, and then it gives you the expected range of motion that you should see with these assessments. If you find that your athlete's limited, you simply follow the sheet over to the quick hitter exercise, like the torsion drill that we showed you before, and that should immediately improve that motion that you tested. And then we also provide strength-based interventions to help that motion last long-term. Once you can reliably test motions and figure out where limitations are and immediately improve them, your clients will not be able to stop bragging about you. And that's exactly what Movement Assessment 101 does. I think it's the best biomechanics-based system for assessing and improving movement for your clients. And if you wanna learn more, you can check it out in the description below. All right, now let's carry on with biomechanics concept number two, muscles work together. And we'll continue working through this basketball athlete case to make this one really actionable. One lens to view movement through is movement options. What movements do I have access to and which ones don't I have access to? So for example, we can see if an athlete has access to hip internal rotation by testing that movement. Generally speaking, when I'm thinking through this lens, I'm trying to find where an athlete is restricted and then give them access to that movement. That's what we did with concept number one, extend the runway. But next, we have to think about how the athlete moves through that runway because it's not just enough to open up the runway, we have to have strength and control to be able to move through the runway effectively. So similar to how joint actions work together, like internal rotation and pronation to absorb force, muscle groups work together. A weak link along the chain can limit the athlete's movement and power. So when testing this athlete's strength, I found one primary weak link, and that was lateral chain strength. This primarily involves the hip abductor muscles, like the gluteus medius, but also the oblique muscle group. A good goal for lateral chain strength is to be able to hold a starfish side plank like this for 30 seconds. This athlete couldn't even hold this position for one second. In fact, he struggled to even do the regressed version with a bent knee. This is a big strength deficit in the lateral chain and it will limit this athlete's ability to absorb and create force at the hip joint. So this is something that we're targeting with training with this side plank variation with the bent knee first, building up to the full side plank over time. Once we bring up that lateral chain strength, we'll be able to handle forces of jumping much better. And this principle applies more broadly to other force couples throughout the body. At the shoulder, for example, the upper traps, lower traps, and serratus anterior should work together as a force couple to position the shoulder blade effectively. It's common for athletes to neglect the serratus anterior and the low trap and lose function of this force couple. So when you're evaluating movement, a helpful biomechanical lens to think through is how the muscle groups are working together to produce a movement. All right, moving on, we have biomechanics concept number three, muscle action becomes nearly isometric at max velocity. When we do a bicep curl, the majority of the motion is coming from the muscle shortening and lengthening. The same goes for a slow controlled calf raise, but things change when you start moving faster and faster. For example, when we're sprinting at max velocity, the foot is in contact with the ground for less than a tenth of a second. That's not enough time for the muscles to actively lengthen and shorten. Instead, the calf muscles, for example, need to contract nearly isometrically. That strong isometric contraction allows the Achilles tendon to quickly lengthen by about half an inch and store a lot of elastic energy and then shorten and give that energy back right away. And this is an essential biomechanical aspect of sprinting. If the muscles can't perform an absurdly strong isometric contraction and they begin to lengthen, then the tendon can't stretch and store energy as effectively. Long story short, to sprint or to do any fast athletic movement, you need to be able to create 
really strong isometric muscle contractions. And this is one reason that a lot of top athletes do use overcoming isometrics, for example, pushing a bar as hard as you can for about two to three seconds in their training. It's a great way to build max muscle recruitment and strength. Also, the nature of it being isometric and really short tends to make a mid-thigh pull or a knee iso push less fatiguing, for example, than a split squat or a deep squat. So when I'm programming for my athletes in the weeks leading up to a big race or a competition, I often shift their primary strength movement from a heavy split squat, for example, to a knee iso push. For performance and around competition, I use three second overcoming isometric contractions with max intensity for about six to 12 total sets. And for tendon rehab or off season to build capacity, I use 30 second isometrics at about 70% max force for about three to five total sets. Knowing the biomechanical principle that muscle action becomes more isometric the faster you move gives you a better understanding for how this fits into your program. So there you have it, the three principles of biomechanics. One, extend the runway. Two, muscles work together. And three, muscle action becomes nearly isometric at max velocity. Practice applying these to athletes for the next 10 years, and you'll be on track to some high-level problem solving. Let me know in the comments below if you want a deep dive into shoulder biomechanics, hip biomechanics, or if there's another topic that you want to see us cover. I'll leave a link in the description below to our full hip mobility masterclass, which is free if you want to check that out and learn more, as well as to our full movement assessment one-on-one -on -one course. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.